change of trainer and revolution, on conversions and opportunistic turns. The Science of Reversal To conclude this investigation into the structure of orthodox retreats to the practicing and artistically heightened life, I shall cast a brief glance at a phenomenon without which the ascetic radicalisms discussed here would remain a mystery. I mean those moments of existential concentration, self-collection and reversal that, from a religion historical perspective one calls, conversions. It should be clear by now that these certainly cannot be considered merely religious events. Rather, they belong to the overall inventory of ascetic behaviour from the recessive position. That is to say, from the stance that develops in response to the absolute imperative. They take on a religious semblance through the combination of practising or radical ethical behaviour with the language games of the sacrifice, regardless of whether one performs these outwardly or inwardly. Sacrifices of the first kind have always been made with blood and fire, and those of the second kind as the renunciation of the will and the transformation of desires. While sacrificial thinking supplies the symbolic code for operations of violent exchange, the practicing life as such provides the foundation for all civilizations, especially those based on internalized forms of sacrifice. In the following I shall cast a second glance at the processes that I have described in terms of secession and recession, detachment from the social environment and withdrawal into oneself. Dealing more closely with the phenomena, it now transpires that these categories are not adequate for identifying the first ethical movement. The spokesmen of the great ascetic caesura were never content to label their behaviour as mere distancing, as a retreat, epoche, to the shore of observation, or an evasion of the real. Even though their own statements of intent do not lack such turns of phrase, Recall that widespread distancing metaphors as flight from the world, fuga mundi, flight from the times, fuga secoli, passionlessness, apatheia, detachment, vairagia, or refuge in the Dharma path. The last great symbol of distance of this type is the quote-unquote angel of history in Walter Benjamin's interpretation, which backs away step by step from the flood of disasters, its eyes fixed in disbelief on the world scene. The concern of the most resolute secessionaries is not simply a fascinated retreat from a reality that no longer invites participation, but rather a complete reversal, a turn away from the superficially manifest, which means a turn towards something that is better, true and real on a higher level. What I would like to sketch here cannot be more than a small preliminary study towards the general science of reversal that was inseparably bound to the older radicalisms of the practicing life. Only through this doctrine of philosophical and ascetic conversion do secessionary and recessive operations gain an object and a direction. And it is no secret that even modern revolutionary teachings still constitute the more distant derivatives of the older statements on beneficial turns and salvatory changes of direction. This means that there is a movement of all movements, without which the concept of truth, according to this tradition of thought, cannot be adequately conceived. This movement, which is not only retreat but also turning, was first accounted for in the ancient occidental tradition by Plato. In his account, the critical movement initially appears as a purely cognitive act, meant to lead from the corrupt, sensible world to the incorruptible world of the spirit. To carry it out, a change of sight from the dark to the light is required, a change that cannot take place, quote, without turning to the whole body, end quote, holo to somati. This marks the first explicit reference to the motif of the integral turn. Analogously, the same faculty must be wheeled around in company with the entire soul, hule to psyche. From seeing to becoming, until one has learned to pay attention only to the eternally existent, and to prefer and endure the brightest part, phenotaton, thereof, the son of good, 
needless to say, the turned soul takes the whole human being with it in its subtle movement. This redirection of sight and existence must not occur by chance and merely once, however, but be developed into a veritable art of turning around, techni periagogies, or an asceticism of a complete existential reversal. This is based on the assumption that those to be turned have their full cognitive apparatus, but that this is initially and mostly turned in the wrong direction due to an age-old bad posture. The philosopher knows about this from his own experience, and he has discovered the cave's exit. He understands what it means to have turned himself around and ventured outside. What he has achieved should not, he feels, be impossible for his fellow humans. Never is he the first orthopedist of the spirit, more generous and more of a stranger to the world than when, as here, he projects his own character onto others. All education is conversion. The implications of these seemingly harmless reflections are literally monstrous. They constitute no less than the first sketch for a doctrine of subversion that holds that pedagogy, morde platonico, must virtually be defined as an integral science of revolution. The license to teach in this field is acquired thus. An individual pioneer of the new way of seeing escapes from the collective cave into the open, and subsequently, initially with inevitable reluctance, overcoming himself, feels ready to descend once more to the wrongly directed in the shadow cinema, and explain to them how the access the how to access these liberations. In this sense, Platonic pedagogy is a pure art of conversion, revolutionary orthopedics. Purely because the philosopher is already a convert, one who is turned around in the first of his kind, can he make it his task to pass on the turn to others. If he simply remained enlightened on his own behalf, he could bask in his private happiness. If he is seized by concern for the state, however, he must abandon privatism and seek to share his illumination with the many. Pierre Hadot calmly encapsulates the surplus flowing from radical reversal. Quote unquote, all education is conversion. One must add, all conversion is subversion. In the instruction to this movement lies an inexhaustible revolutionary potential, at least as long as it does not content itself with individual reversal. At the start, after all, because of the strict parallelism between the psyche and the polis, it always had to be concerned with the universalization of turning, and sought to include virtually all members of the commune it meant to reform in the other way of living. It was only the later philosophical schools, the Stoics, the Epicureans and the Neoplatonists, that made private tuition a central concern. For them it became a sign of wisdom to content oneself with the conversion of individuals and give up on the incorrigible many. Hence their belief that there is no wisdom without resignation, and no resignation without a certain consent to the cruelty of life. They abandoned the plan to reform the souls of the state at once, not only because they no longer wanted to believe in the parallelism between the two factors, but also because they began to recognise in the state that cold monster which they were convinced could not possibly be the valid analogue of the soul. There were good reasons for the timing of the individualistic retreat from Plato's over-enthusiasm, from this excess of missionary zeal that denizens of the modern age would term utopian. The doctrine of periagogy, the turning around of the soul, which was later often combined with the term epistrophe, was in fact the first explicit version of the absolute imperative, you must change your life framed in the exhortation to turn one's entire being towards the spiritual side. This imperative was first formulated in a holistic variation that led to numerous severe misunderstandings. In its deep structure, the Platonic doctrine of learning by the Son of Truth had remained an occulted sacrificial theory, related in this respect to the ascetic systems appearing in Asia at the same time, as the turning around of the soul could ultimately only be defined as a relinquishment of the particular in favour of the general. 
The consequence was that this version of the absolute imperative was affected by two profoundly misconstruable factors. The first was the verb, in that change, here meant something along the lines of sacrifice oneself to the general, and the second lay in the possessive pronoun, in that the adepts were secretly disposed of their lives, which were instead handed over to the true whole that was yet to be created. You are in the world for the sake of the whole, not vice versa. This is the corresponding admonition in Plato's Nomoi, quote, we do not belong to ourselves, end quote. We are still told today in we are still told today in traditions of this type. Quote unquote, we do not belong to ourselves, we are still told today in traditions of this type. This is the origin of anthropotechnic tendencies that pervert the absolute imperative of reading quote unquote life instead of quote unquote your life. Though here on the terrain of antiquity the word life admittedly has more political than bioscientific implications. Compared to this, the apolitical spiritual systems of late antiquity were absolutely right to insist that individuals should be taken seriously as individuals. Only for that reason had they been concerned to initiate themselves into the craft of life, concern for oneself, lege artis. Like an ancient anticipation of the modern restriction of the right to arrest, the Habeas Corpus Amendment Act of 1679, they undo the individual's helplessness before the whole and assert its inalienable claim to a self-determined life, even if, as prisoners of reality, they are forced to accept certain curtailments of their right to freedom. It would take a millennium and a half until the holistic coup of the Christian, post-Christian Neoplatonist, Hegel, and his materialistic followers put the idea of universal conversion back on the agenda of modernity, with the known consequences, predominantly bloody consequences that, taken as a whole, go back to the amalgamation of the Greco-Germanic philosophy of liberation, and the ideas of the French Revolution. I will show in chapter 11 how his amalgam led to an anthropotechnics that was intended to help produce the new human being, this time as the product of a political conversion that did not rule out the rebuilding of the body, and still, questionably enough, in line with holistic concepts of quote-unquote society, where it is only ever a small step from the over-elation of the whole to the sacrifice of the part. The Catastrophe Before Damascus In the meantime, the motif of reversal, which had initially been primarily the domain of political theory, and the philosophical art of living, had been monopolised by religious interpretations. Their paradigm was the conversion of Paul on the road to Damascus, commented upon countless times. There are two accounts of this defining moment in the Acts of the Apostles, once in autobiographical form as part of Paul's defence speech before the Jews in Jerusalem, Acts 22, and once in the third person, Acts 9. Both versions emphasise that Paul was turned around through the event on the road to Damascus, transformed from a persecutor of Christians to an envoy of Christianity. In the personalised version, the story is as follows, quoting Acts 22 verses 6 through 10. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. End quote. The third-person account of the same events, which was located near the beginning of the Acta Apostolorum, contains only one substantial variation. It emphasises that the companions stood by speechless because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Acts 9 verse 7. According to, uh, considering this tale, one thing is clear. 
Even here we are already light years away from the sublime platonic reflections on the turning of the soul, and its guidance from the cave of collective sensory illusions. There is no reference to the concerns of Greek rationalism, or the turn towards the sun of truth. The light that dazzles the zealot on the road to Damascus is a mixture of midday demon and hallucination. The story is already set firmly on the terrain of magical conception of the world. Spengler even assigned it to the atmospheric space of the quote-unquote Arabian cultural soul, whose mood is defined by apocalyptic expectation, salvation panic, and a miracle-hungry, supranaturalistic hermeneutics. Most of all, it displays a, the spirit of a zealotry that is ready to leave for any destination, and which barely seems to care whether it heats up in one direction or another. Placed against the background of the philosophical concept of conversio, or epistrophe, Paul's experience is by no means a conversion which would have completely changed his personal habitus. Nor was it for a moment a realisation, but rather the encounter with a divine voice that has no qualms about manifesting itself in the world. Taken as a whole, what happened to Paul is no more than the reprogramming of a zealot in the precise sense of the word. The term is justified, because the operating system of Paul's personality could continue to be used more or less unchanged after the reversal, but now freed up for an extraordinary theological creativity. The conversion of Paul therefore belongs to an entirely different category of turnings that display an apostolic zealotic culture, a uh, character, not an ethical revolutionary one. The theological tradition provides the term metanoia for this, whose general tendency is best formulated as change of heart, with penitence as the heightened Christian to perform. From a psychodynamic perspective, the term belongs in a force field of the inner collection that seems appropriate before or after great events, whether after a personal or political defeat that forces a re-evaluation of one's decorum, one's guiding maxims in life, or an anticipation of an imminent event that is apocalyptically foreshadowed. Metanoia is above all a panic phenomenon, in that it goes hand in hand with the gesture of pulling oneself together in a crisis, and getting serious before the looming end. It is no coincidence that the era of the European Reformation, which was swarming with people who wanted to get serious, was another heyday of the dark belief in astral influence and the fear of end times. The modus operandi of metanoia is not the turning around of the personality, but rather the collection and heeding of the long known, which, for lack of an immediate occasion, one had previously avoided examining in full depth. This applies especially to Paul, who, while pursuing the Jewish dissidents who had joined the Jesuit sect, would have had ample opportunity to understand that they essentially had the more coherent interpretation of the tradition already, and that they were the ones who were given the messianic element of Jewish doctrine, the most exciting of all possible readings. What Paul experienced on the road to Damascus, then, was a metanoetic episode, that led to a reorganisation of consciousness from the perspective of a newly formed centre of the highest conviction. This constitutes a process that William James, in the chapters devoted to conversions in his classic Gifford Lectures of 1901, The Varieties of Religious Experience, sought to interpret using a suggestive general schema. In the subliminal consciousness of the subject, a new epicentric personality core prepares itself and merges with the hot spot of operative self-awareness at an opportune moment, bringing about an intense transformative experience. The application of this model to the case of Paul immediately yields a consistent picture in practice theoretical terms. He had already trained with the opponent for some time. His exercises and hostility towards the Jesuits had put him in sufficient form to cross over to the position of his previous adversary at the right moment. He had long formed a clear, albeit still unwelcome, idea of this adversary's strengths on the pre-conscious level. 
In this context, it seems significant that in the autobiographical version of the scene on the road to Damascus, he already addresses the speaker who calls him from above as Lord, Kairi, even before he has identified himself as the Jesus he has been persecuting. Everything would suggest that his second person was waiting for this interjection. From this point of view, Paul was not a convert, let alone a revolutionary, as is claimed in recent neo-Jacobin interpretations of the Pauline phenomenon, but rather an opportunist, in the sense of Machiavelli's theory of opportunity, who, in spite of himself, had long since recognised the high spiritual chances of the new doctrine he had initially fought. He had understood, at first intuitively and later explicitly, that only a messiah who genuinely came could help the political hopeless, the politically hopeless and intellectually stagnating Judaism of his time to escape from its rut. Naturally, he had never remotely intended to found or set in motion universalism or even a subjective variation thereof. He simply applied himself to reformatting an elect group, much like the professional revolutionary of the Leninist caste, who were always more elitist exterminists than inclusion-friendly universalists, and like the no longer numerous successors of Robespierre in France. It is characteristics of conversions of this type that they occur more in the mode of yielding to an already pre-consciously recognised self-evidence than of adopting a completely new doctrine. James quotes extensively from the accounts of heavy drinkers who, through a form of religious self-collection, usually in a Protestant environment with strong conversion stereotypes, had managed to ally themselves with their existing, but previously powerless, better judgment, and thus distance themselves from their addiction. There is no conversion. The Augustinian Paradigm. In this context, we have an opportunity to re-evaluate Oswald Spengler's strong thesis that essentially, conversions do not exist. Only reoccupations of vacant positions in the fixed structures of a culture's field of options. The basal, soul atmosphere of an advanced, civilised complex remains identical through all superficial changes of confession, he argues. And what seems like a U-turn from the outside can, in reality never be more than an ultimately arbitrary variation, albeit occasionally a far-reaching one for present and future generations within a clearly demarcated space of possibility. Hence, in spiritual matters too, the saying applies, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chance. I apologise, I'm certain I butchered that. <coughs> The suggestiveness of this claim can best be explained using the example of a second conversion hero in Christian tradition, Aurelius Augustinus, who in his confessions famously stylized the entire story of his youth as a protracted hesitation before his conversion in 386. In his case, Spengler's theorem seems supremely plausible. One can easily use his life story like those of countless analogous confession changes and serious getters, to show that no trace of a conversion ever took place in the deep structure of his personality. Rather, within an age-old orientation towards the world above, he simply changed addresses, or the great other, the transcendent trainer, several times, from Manichaeism to Platonism, from Platonism to philosophical Christianity, from philosophical Christianity to a theocentrically darkened cult of submission. He was no anomaly in this. As early as the 2nd century AD, quote-unquote, conversions to philosophy had taken place among the educated members of the Roman ecumenical community, and these were organically continued in adoptions of Christianity. In the case of Justin the Martyr, for example, the Catholic patron saint of philosophers, At no point in these multiple rebuildings of his edifice of convictions did Augustine go through a complete epistrophe. He simply radicalised the break with worldly life, already foreshadowed in the Manichaic beginnings bit by bit, until he attained a personally condensed and completely embodiable form of ascetic rejection of this world. 
nor did the famous take up and read, Tola Lege, contain any new discovery, merely a reminder of familiar motifs that had ripened within his epicentric personality for the inner takeover. Thus, in ideal typical purity, he embodied the qualities of the sick soul, or the depressively divided self, of which William James showed how, not infrequently, it also achieves the collection of its powers in a gradual or sudden unification without any religious turn. In psychological terms, what, con- what converts have often described as the effect of grace manifests itself above all as a personal energy gain as a result of increased in- integration. Such integration takes place when the entire system of mental drives is subordinated to a unified perspective of purpose. It is due to this effect that all partial forces now work together under the direction of a previously latent new centre of conviction. Such a united subject experiences itself as simultaneously called upon and moved. The movebo effect manifests itself in it with twice the strength. In the case of Augustine, the unification seemed to have been reached at the point when he achieved the concentration of all partial energies in the gesture of Christian platonic self-abandonment. The candidate's long hesitation furthermore proves that during his time, a complete conversion to Christianity had to be undertaken as an entrance into a training camp surrounded by ascetic horrors. The Byzantine Asceteria, or the Western Monasterium. It was thus never purely a matter of the faith so often invoked by Paul, but rather the total subordination of the person to the harsh practice law of the imitatio with fatal results, or the monastic metaphorization thereof. It seems only consistent then if the initial eutonic balance between philosophy and religion in Augustine's early writings gave way in time to his bleaker late theology. The originality of Augustine's conversion is only evident in the determination with which the convert managed to elevate his transformation to the exemplary level. His confessions are the first model of Christian performance literature, the transformation of a life story into a lesson in grace. What helped Augustine most to carry out this performative turn was his Christian radicalization of the Platonic doctrine of the psyche's original malposition. In Augustine's vision, what Plato had described merely as the factual fixation of those trapped in the cave on the shadow play on the cave walls, in neutral terms, what the priority of empirically oriented perception over reflective insight among worldlings, is immediately declared a consequence of original sin. A repetition of the first, quote-unquote, perversion in which the creature turned away from its creator, preferring itself to its origin. From that point on, sinful egotism governs all actions, as life and perversion always means idolising the things one should be using, sensual and worldly things, and using the things one should honour, spiritual and godly things. The perverted creature, according to Augustine, cannot perform the complementary reversal to undo the resulting metaphysical damage by its own strength. It would remain incurably fixed in its fallen position, its abandonment of origin, if God himself did not accommodate it in the person of Christ and enable its reconversion. Spengler was certainly exaggerating when he rejected the possibility of conversion with a given culture out of hand. But there were good reasons for his objection, as the vast majority of actual conversions take place not in the mode of an epistrophic total reversal, but of a transition to a more or less natural alternative. Ultimately, a truly radical change only occurs upon taking the advanced civilised path as such, which trains mortals for the high forms of vertical tension by injecting them with the madness of longing for the impossible. Seneca defines the individual revolutionary character of this turn late on, but clearly when he declares Desinamos quo voluimus vele, let us cease wanting what we previously wanted, the will to want differently sets in motion the permanently tense concern for the new, unaccustomed and improbable stance. Chapter 
One could say something similar for the doctrine of Epicurus, which in its way meant practicing the break with the vulgar modus vivendi, because wisdom implies emancipation from the mistaken faith in the predominance of Tyche, in the predominance or, uh, yes, wisdom implies emancipation from the mistaken faith in the predominance of Tyche or Fortuna. It aims for a radical departure from ordinary concerns. Where there was fear of the gods, there shall now be fearlessness. This already heralds the Enlightenment, the conversion of the spirit to a use of one's own life without religious intimidation. Religiously encoded conversions, on the other hand, usually only display the character of a switch to an alternative cult system with rearranged compulsions. This process can generally be imagined as a shallow operation. Even the striking inversion figure, burn what you worship, then to worship what you burned, in no way makes the procedure more inward. It merely formulates the directive to give Christ the ritual attentions previously reserved for Votan, or whatever forest, wind and mountain gods one used to follow. With numerous other religiously coded conversions too, one observes most of all the meta-noetic shifts of emphasis within a heavily pre-structured field. Even in the psychoanalysis of the 20th century, incidentally, one can still hear echoes of the ancient conversio. From a distance, the Freudian maxim, where there was id, there shall be ego, reveals its membership in the group of metanoetic practices, where the change of living, living habits is accompanied by a change of subject. That is to say, a reallocation of the guiding figure to the place of the great other. Here, the id corresponds typologically to the murky category of demonic possession, and the ego to monotheistic brightening. Conversion as change of trainer, St. Francis and Ignatius. From a practice-theoretical perspective, conversions of the metanoetic type amount to a change of trainer, as the converts generally submit not only to an altered moral regime and ao ipso a new great other, but also a new practice plan. The personality structure as such, however, is usually kept throughout the change. Thus, the long habitualized zealotry of Paul after Damascus was reassigned from Pharisaic to Jesuit principles, and subsequently expanded with Christological supplements of his own making. Certainly it makes a difference whether one trains with Gamaliel, the rabbinical teacher, or with Jesus, the resurrected. One would be doing an injustice to the people's apostle if one reduced the opus Christi he set in motion exclusively to its zealotic element. In submitting to Christian doctrine in the matter of love, agave, or caritas, Paul had experienced a notable expansion of his personality, and the success story of Christianity would simply be unthinkable without Paul's stretching of the horizon of chosenness, which, as noted above, must not be confused with universalism. The metanoetic forms of reversal would consistently prove the most far-reaching for the further development of Christianity as the most important practice field and habitus generator in the transitional space between antiquity and the Middle Ages. Alongside these, the real initiatic sacrament, baptism, remained a momentary and external matter. An effective remoulding of human beings does not depend on a single, singular gesture. It can only succeed as a result of lasting self-curatorial efforts. The interpretation of baptism as rebirth lends the act of a symbolic depth that does not have any adequate correlate in terms of internalization. The extent to which Christian metanoia amounts to a change of practice system and trainer figure is shown not least by the two most popular conversion legends of the High Middle Ages and Early Modern Age those of St. Francis of Assisi and Ignatius of Loyola. If one examines the turn of the young Francis, it was anything but a sudden leap into the Christian camp. In a certain sense, the youth had long been prepared for the later turn, whose immediate cause was the well-known conflict of authority with his father, since internalising a robust form of knightly idealism and an elegant, 
quasi-provencal rhetoric of courtly love. Commentators often refer in this context to his mother's French descent. It was when Francis seemingly turned against his own origins and his spectacular renunciation of paternal authority that he began to consolidate them all the more. In the symbolic area, it was only a small step from the noble dames of troubadour poetry to the quote-unquote lady poverty whom he now served. And similarly, the elegant upper-class Platonism underlying the courtly cult of ladies and honour, which had visibly affected the middle classes of Assisi, was not far from the people's Platonism offered by late ancient and medieval Christianity. Once again, the novelty lies purely in the decision, in the focus on the one thing that collects individual power where, quote-unquote, there is need. The young Francis was unmistakably seized by the zeitgeist. The Christianity of the early urban period was looking for a superstar, With the role of poverty's troubadour, he had found a position that allowed him to transpose the imitatio Christi into an allegory of courtly love. By learning to draw sweetness from bitterness, he gained leeway for the release of mental energy to compensate for the constant depression of the coming centuries. The growing scandal of involuntary poverty in an era that was increasingly devoting itself to wealth. By practicing self-denial for the sake of lady poverty, he created surplus powers from the weakest point, albeit at a price that already made his contemporaries shudder. He paid this price in the form of a triumphant self-chastisement that would not rest until total imitation, the emulation of the crucified through the duplication of his wounds, had been achieved. Thomas of Solano put his finger on the critical point. Quote, Nothing else could spring up in that soil, since from the first that wonderful cross claimed it for its own. End quote. For the imitator, Christi, this inevitably meant that he must live no longer than his model. Without the imperative of following the Lord even in the duration of his life, the, his deliberate self-attrition would have been inconceivable. The pantomime of his death shows how much he was still thinking in the traditional terms of the ascetic agon and Christian athletism. Quote, For, worn down by his serious illness that was being wrought to an end with every suffering, he had himself placed naked upon the naked ground, so that in the final hour when the enemy could still rage against him, he might wrestle naked with a naked enemy. He waited without a fear for his triumph, and with his hands clasped, he was grasping a crown of justice. End quote. For Francis and his followers, the thought form of imitatio went so deep that the small congregation surrounding the dying man even celebrated the Last Supper, coming dangerously close to blasphemous parody. In this imaginative field, the reappearance of the deceased to some friars in a transfigured state was naturally a must. It was recognised that his person and that of Christ had merged into one, and the same person, an indication that intense supernaturalisms appear in the form of fields and develop in spaces of synchronously practised suggestibility. The case of Ignatius of Loyola also shows all the hallmarks of a classic change of trainer under the sign of metanoia. Although these are already distant from the sacred expressionism of the performance artist Francis, the conversion mechanism manifests itself here in strictly analogous forms. In keeping with the code of honour during that period, the structure of the young noble's personality was fully developed, and his horizon of ambition saturated with the popular concepts of knightly life and the lady cult. After the catastrophe of the Battle of Pamplona in 1521, which left the 30-year-old officer crippled, and removed him from the ranks of the pretenders to worldly fame, he too was seized by the spirit of the age, which this time suggested an imitatio Christi in militant forms. Ignatius changed trainers. Switching from Amadis of Gaul, the hero of the chivalric novel, to Christ, who now appears in the form of a divine general who can only be imitated by earthly elite troops, 
I have discussed the unforeseeable consequences of the Ignatian turn for the further history of Catholic and more general forms of subjectification at greater length elsewhere. They are inseparable from the modernization of practice. In this case, from the transference of the military training principle to the new roles of religion political achievement, which were formed on the battlefields of the Counter-Reformation. What makes Loyola's place in the history of subject techniques so exceptionally significant is that all earlier layers of autoplastic practice had successfully been sedimented within it, and had successfully been sedimented within it in complete clarity. What began with the drill of the Greek and Roman soldiers, and was continued by athletes and gladiators before Christian hermits and Cenobites appropriated the ascetic secrets of these agonists. All this returned after 1521 in the existence of the failed soldier, leading to the strongest surge in newer psychotechnic exercises. This time, however, corresponding to the humanistic milieu with its neo-rhetorical rupture, it was in the form of a theatre of the imagination, in which the practising person, following strict instructions, convinces themselves of their own worthlessness and immeasurable guilt before the Saviour. In their time, the Jesuit exercises, this autogenic training and contrition over thirty hard days and nights of utmost concentration, obviously form the newest layer in the stratagram of old European practice cultures whose older and most ancient layers lead back to the beginnings of heroism and athleticism. Recent neuro-rhetorical research, incidentally, shows that the artificial effects produced in exercises are physiologically indistinguishable from natural ones. The almost instrumental grab of the Jesuit technique for the trusting psyche which itself turns meditation into a training camp, explicitly heralded the beginning of what would later be called the modern age. Its inhabitants developed into modern people, to the extent that they convinced themselves that they had discovered the secret of self-determination in exchanging absolute dependence on God for human self-assertion. We will see that nothing could be further from the truth 